Welcome to the Good Growing Podcast. I am Chris Enroth, horticulture educator with University of Illinois Extension in Macomb, Illinois, and we have got a great show for you today. We're going to be talking with someone who is out in the field quite a bit, and in the field, I mean out in nature, prairie, the woods, wetlands, you name it. Uh, so we're going to be talking with Sarah Johnson here in just a second, but before we get to Sarah, we have to introduce our co-host with us every single week. We are joined by local foods educator Katie Parker in Adams County. Hi, Katie. Hey there, Chris. How are you doing today? I'm seeing the forecast for some chilly temperatures ahead of us, and I guess it's back to hoodie weather. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, how are you? Hoodie weather, and then um, I think it's supposed to get warm again next week, so maybe we'll all kind of get some sickness going on. Yes, get those colds brewing right. for us. Yeah, my yep. spinach will be very happy with the nighttime temps coming up. Oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, someone who I know is going to be very happy with these cooler temperatures. He's a resident Viking. Uh, we have horticulture educator Ken Johnson in Jacksonville, Illinois. Hey, Ken. Hello, Chris and Katie. I think I may have jumped the gun on cutting my beard shorter and cutting my hair. <laughs> yes. Believe it or not, folks, his beard was was twice the length <laughs> just last week. I think that's why we're getting cold weather now or cooler weather. That's exactly why you, oh, you cut fault. the hair. You, you cut the hair or you water the plants. It's, it's whatever you do, which then initiates that response in nature. So that's, that's how that goes. So, well, I, I am excited to uh, talk with our guests today. So we are going to be joined by uh, Sarah Johnson. So Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Hello. <laughs> well, hello, and we are excited to have you here. So, Sarah, you are a research assistant with the Illinois Natural History Survey. Is that correct? That is correct. I oh. am a recent master's student, uh, not quite graduate, but I did just defend my thesis. So, yeah. Oh, well, congratulations. <laughs> uh, a thesis defense is so much fun, and I hope everyone on your committee didn't just shock you with just like <laughs> as that happened to a couple people in, in my program where it's like oh you were on my committee why didn't you bring up these issues that you're now showing in front of everybody but but yes I hope it went well oh it did I have a wonderful uh couple advisors and committee and they gave me really good feedback so I was really happy about it yeah no no meanness or maliciousness there it was great wonderful that's awesome so so Sarah, um, we're going to get into what you do, but I am always curious uh, when we have folks on, and, and this is, um, we've had, I don't know if you might be the first type of like field botanist we've had on the show, um, but so I, I'm curious, let's say I call your office, someone picks up and they say, Sarah, is she's out doing her most absolute favorite thing in her most absolute favorite place, what are you doing and where would I find you? Oh, well, I really do love my job. Um, and the great thing is that it's a, a variety all the time, but I would say my favorite place to be is early morning out doing field work before it gets too hot. Of course. Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, in a prairie or Savannah somewhere where there's usually some trees, but uh, a lot of herbaceous plants and a lot of insects, a lot of birds. Um, I enjoy all wildlife beyond plants. So anywhere that I can have a combination of those things. And I really like doing kind of the slow field work. So getting settled into a, a site, doing maybe some floristic assessments or seeing what type of uh, plant and wildlife is there is my, my favorite type of field work. So setting up a transect and going meter by <laughs> meter, uh, however long that transect goes. Yeah. I like looking at awesome. um, very small things. So I, I like doing uh, kind of some of the minutia, you know, that's why I like getting stuck into a site. So. So what brought you to the, <clears throat> the world of field botany? And I guess before we talk about that, what, what exactly is field, a field botanist for those who may not know what that is? Yeah, I would say a field botanist is different than a, um, you know, someone who maybe studies plants in a more uh, lab oriented way. So there's a, a wide world of botany and biology, right? And a lot of people who study plants can go from studying things like systematics, like relatedness of plants uh, in phylogenetic trees, like how they're related to other plants, 
um, you know, chemical properties of plants, um, kind of the systematic aspect. But then also there's some of us who go out in the field and either obtain plants, obtain records of plants, um, understand more of the less biology, but maybe some more of the ecology of plants. So how do they fit into their ecosystem? Um, what is their relationship with plant, other plants and insects and really just the habitat that they're in? And so I would say a field botanist is one who we call a, a muddy boots ecologist. So we go out and we are in the field, um, you know, collecting that data or actual plants. So what got me into botany? Um, a long path. I don't know how much time you want me to spend on it, but you know, real quick assessment is I've like many have always been, you know, just interested in the outdoors. I spent a lot of time outside as a kid, um, climbing my big spruce tree in the backyard at my dad's house and collecting ants that my grandmother was like, please don't bring those in the house. And uh, <laughs> looking at birds and plants on my grandparents' property. Uh, in New York is where I grew up. And so I spent a lot of time just outdoors as a kid and then went to undergrad as a pre-med student, took a field ecology class that like blew my mind. I was like, you can work outside and, and, and get paid to do it? That sounds pretty sweet. Um, so then, yeah, I started on this journey after many years of doing just like seasonal field work. So I started working with birds and I was doing a lot of bird banding and like auditory surveys for birds. Uh, I did bat work. So I did bridge surveys and mist netting for bats. And I think kind of when you start getting into this world, you're like, oh, plants are kind of the base of all of the restoration efforts and the conservation efforts that we do, right? So how can we save species if we can't save habitat? And plants are habitat. So, um, I was starting to look into graduate programs and um, Dr. Brenda Milano Flores, my current advisor, had this great project in Florida, which I kind of probably wouldn't have agreed to if I knew it was in July in Florida, <laughs> but I'm really grateful for it now. And I've absolutely loved everything I've, I've done throughout graduate school. So kind of that's how I, I navigated into field botany. And I always say if, if you love plants, you can go anywhere because there's always cool plants to see. So that's kind of how I got into it. I'll say as somebody who used to live in Florida, I can agree with your assessment of Florida in July and August. Oh, man. I went in September for a return trip. I was like, I think it's worse than July. It's so hot and humid. But you can always tell I'm the outsider. Like you walk into the bar and you're like, man, it's hot. And you're like, <laughs> like yeah we know like get used to it you know so so you've had the opportunity to do a lot of exploring and researching rare plants and rare habitats in Florida and Illinois of the species or the plant species that you study would you consider those endangered or are they more so rare occurrences uh both for sure so the study, the plant I study specifically is called Macbridea alba, and it is a herbaceous mint. So um, herbaceous meaning non-woody. There are many woody mints. So if you think of some you might grow in your garden, that would be like rosemary um, as opposed to something, well, sage also could be a lot of the sages we grow tend to be woody, but an herbaceous mint would be something more like, a, you know, spearmint or, or something like that. So in Florida, specifically, there's a, a diversity of mints, and the species I study is one of only two uh, in that genus of Macbridea, and both species are quite rare, and the reason this, this one is considered rare and threatened and endangered is it's endemic, meaning only in those places to four counties, so four counties in the entire world, um, so it's <laughs> It's restricted to where it lives. And also um, the amount of plants, the populations are restricted within those areas too. So it's, it's rare, but also endangered um, being a like federal and state designation of threatened and endangered. So um, 
of, uh, you know, that species is one of many in that area that are, are listed. And this is something you see a lot with endemism or small range species where those tend to be uh, federally or state protected as, as threatened or endangered because they just don't occur many places. What are some examples of uh, rare habitat in Illinois? And then also what is considered one of the greatest threats to losing these places? Yeah, one, um, one area I can think of in particular is um, particularly up in the Chicago region, there's a lot of fens and um, kind of like ephemeral wetland type habitats, so seasonal wetlands. And we have done a project up in the Chicago area for a while looking at a tree species, Thuja occidentalis, which is an arbor vitae. Um, and that is a fen specific species. So what a fen is, is it's a groundwater fed ecosystem. So it, it also gets rainwater, of course, but there's no, you know, other source for water in these ecosystems. So they're really dependent on clean sources of fresh water. And so these types of habitats are really affected by any pollution of the water. Um, one that we're looking at is salt pollution. So how is salt runoff from the thruway or other areas in the city affecting those types of habitats? So as you can imagine, um, salt does a lot of things. It can be great for salt adapted species, but for species that aren't adapted to that type of uh, habitat, salt can you know, mimic drought conditions, it can change the pH, it can change the soil concentration um, and, and nutrients within that soil that are available. It can do a lot of different things to habitats. So especially for, for places that are dependent on that clean water supply, um, you know, that's a threat that we, we observe kind of closely. Um, and another cool rare habitat is, um, you know, more rare now are some of these sand prairies or habitats that have been created on these outwashes from the, the Great Lake Chicago um, millions of years ago <laughs> that created these kind of like dunes within um, West Central Illinois, particularly. And that those are really, really unique ecosystems. And they're just mostly um, at threat by, of course, land use changes and, um, you know, loss of habitat, which we've lost a lot of within the state of Illinois. So it, is a sand prairie the same as like a hill prairie? Because I've seen a few of those cases here and, and even like IDOT, the Illinois Department of Transportation, they will even route some of their roads around these sites so as not to disturb them. Is a sand prairie the same as a hill prairie? Uh, it's very similar. Yeah, it's so I think hill prairies now, I'm not 100% sure because this isn't my expertise, mm -hmm. but I'm more of like a, a for fun botanist in this way. Mm -hmm. Um, but hill prairies, like I can think of one uh, nearby that is on the shores, like kind of on the upper shores of um, river habitats, so floodplain habitats. And so there is some of that depositing of sand. But when I think of sand prairies, I think of more of um, true like dune type habitat on top of on top of the land. And so you often get these strange, phenomena of like blowouts where the wind has just whipped around and created kind of basins for unique plant species to assemble. And um, I mean, that's based on my limited knowledge, that's kind of the difference, but very, very similar structure, similar soil structure. So a lot of the plants you see tend to be similar. Yeah. And then what goes into rare plant conservation and what can be done to help to protect and possibly expand some of these rare habitats? Sure. I, I mean, this is a big focus of the research I do is trying to figure out where to start with plant conservation. <laughs> um, you know, for a plant like I've been studying for the past few years um, and many plants that are, are rare and threatened, we don't know much about them. And the first step is really trying to understand those plants and the ecosystems where they live so that we can um, understand some of the nuance in protecting them, right? So a, a, a trend in places like Illinois and Florida are that we need burning, right? We need frequent um, burning to keep woody encroachment low and to keep that soil um, kind of regenerating and knocking back that, um, you know, kind of 
just, just keeping the disturbance high so that you can knock back that competition from other plant species. Um, and so the biggest thing with rare plant conservation is that there are often limited funds for plant conservation. So 5% um, of conservation dollars go to plant species, even though they are the majority of, of species listed in the United States. And so one big thing we can do to help plants is to, to fix that problem and that gap and disparity. So adding more funding for plants. Um, but in places like Illinois, where we've lost a lot of habitat, I mean, re restoring and, and gaining additional lands that are protected, whether that be through, you know, public lands that are like state parks, national forests, um, and limiting the extractive uses that we use those lands for. But also like private land is severely underutilized. Um, so putting lands in conservation easements or even just you know, planting species in your backyard, if you, if you have permission to plant them, um, you know, private land is a, is a huge portion of, of what we have in America and really underutilized for conservation. Um, so not, yeah, protecting property, um, suitable habitat, more funding. And I always say like, if you are interested in plants, just growing plants, um, and, and helping others source them too. Um, so I grow a lot of plants from seed and I try to give them to as many people as possible just to encourage you know, more people growing and learning how to grow plants because um, if these plants are struggling in the wild, they, they may actually need help to supplement their populations. You know, And as horticulturists, you love growing plants, you're a great resource for trying to understand those nuances and how to grow these plants. So those are some, some starting points, but there's endless opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I have acquired a mint um, a few years ago and uh, it was told, I was told it was a, a rare mint and it, it doesn't survive in, in Illinois, but um, mm -hmm. the leaves are almost succulent, a little pubescent. And it, I think they might have gathered it from uh, a botanical garden uh, down in southern part of the U.S. So, um, so, so yeah, I, I, I'm trying to do my part uh, for uh, probably a non-native Illinois species, but still, uh, it's 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 really cool. It's it's minty ish ish, um, square stems, but it's like a succulent almost. It's pretty neat. Yeah, I feel like mints are, so many people don't realize that most, like many of the plants that they're growing in their garden are mints. Um, you know, oregano, uh, you know, most of these like herb plants that we're growing are, are mints. Um, and there's, they're so, like you said, succulent leaves, they've got hairy leaves, some of them are really thin leaved. Um, square stem is the, the key though, yeah, almost, I think I would say all mints have have the square stem, and that's a good way to designate them from other plants. Yeah, yeah. Some people might find it to be like an oxymoron, though, saying, "Oh, a mint and rare yeah. plant," because you put lemon balm or something in a in a yard, and in a few years, it's everywhere. Oh, for sure, right? And I I I feel like there's so many friends of mine that are like, "I will give you, <laughs> like, a, please, everyone, take these mints off my hands. I can't get rid of them." Um, but that's, what's funny, right? Is you don't think of mint and rare. So when looking into this plant species, you're like, why, why is it so rare? Um, and it clearly grows, um, by like vegetatively. So, you know, when you watch your mint going out of control in the garden, it's likely because it's spreading by runners. It's not seeding itself all over the place, although that's possible too. Um, and it just grows, spreads out clonally. Um, and that's something we're investigating, investigating a little bit more with this plant is how frequently is it growing by those runners as opposed to seed, because this could give us some indication of one, how, how genetically variable these populations are. Maybe they're all just one big plant or one population of, of um, not mixed stock, right? Not mixed genetic stock. And so it's good to know just generalizations about families sometimes. So when you're looking at plants or trying to learn more about plants, just ha having a general idea of how that family of plants lives in the world mm -hmm. and how it grows is super important. So 
gardening has definitely informed, um, you know, some of my field botany skills too. So that, that biodiversity component, you know, people are familiar with the one mint that they grow in the garden, but then now hearing this and they're probably like, so this, there's a whole other realm to this. That's yeah. I think it's, it, I think it opens people up to the, the idea of biodiversity, ecosystem health and, and, and beyond. So you mentioned earlier that um, you did your kind of your research down in Florida, other than being hot, and humid and gross during the summer. What's it like doing field botany in Florida? And, you know, somebody from, you said you're from New York or somebody from Illinois, you know, if you're a botanist, can you just go down to Florida and just kind of pick up, kind of figure out all the plant material or is there a little bit of a learning curve there? Uh, there is a huge learning curve from places like New York. So New York has very few prairie species left. Um, so we have some prairie remnants. And just as a fun story, like I remember going out botanizing in New York and we were looking for this, this tree, this shrub that had these weird fruits. And it was this really epic hike to go out to this, this spot up on the Niagara Escarpment to look for these plants. And we got there and it was pawpaw and it was like blowing our minds. We're like, whoa, this is crazy. And then you come to Illinois and they're literally everywhere. <laughs> and you're like, this is something I struggled to see in New York. And now it's everywhere. Um, so the cool thing is we do have some of these kind of like prairie relic species in New York, but the types of plants that you see growing in the prairie ecosystems of Illinois are very similar in the types of families you're seeing represented in Florida. So that savanna habitat, even though there's, you know, difference between maybe oak savannas in Illinois and pine savannas in Florida, it's still a similar habitat structure and similar plant species. So a lot of liatris, um, you know, aster diversity, liatris, goldenrods. Um, you see quite a lot of mints, uh, scutellarias. Um, one really cool one is, is, I think it's trichostema, it's a blue curl. So they look, um, they have this kind of weird shape to them. Uh, so you see a lot of those similar species, but then you'll also see really cool, crazy stuff down in Florida, like a ton of carnivorous plants. So you see droseras, um, which are sundews. They have those sticky leaves. Um, you see pitcher plants, so saracenias, and there's a massive diversity of saracenia down in Florida. So some of these were similar to plants I've seen. Like we do have saracenia purpurea in Illinois and New York, um, but those are in more bog habitats like up north. Uh, we don't see them so much down here. So you're seeing similar species, but the vibe is totally different. Um, and so going down to Florida, what I really, um, what really struck me is the, um, you know, as someone who hasn't spent a lot of time in Florida, a lot of people love to hate on Florida because it's seen as this just like vast wasteland of human expansion, right? Which is definitely true in many places of the state. Um, but one thing about the panhandle of Florida where I work is it's called the Forgotten Coast. And thank God it's been forgotten because there is some really beautiful, large public lands like Apalachicola National Forest. And they do an incredible job of managing with fire in Apalachicola and Illinois does as well. We're, we're good with prescribed fire and people feel comfortable with it, which is really important. Um, but the habitats down there are just wild. I mean, you have similar to places like central Illinois, very little change in topography. But what's cool is these tiny little spots of change in the habitat can make massive differences in the types of plants that grow there. So I think of something similar in, in this sand prairie I talked about in Illinois, you see different species on those kind of like upland areas than you see in the sand blowouts. And the same is for Florida, you'll see totally different plant species in the wetland, depressional wetland areas than you see in the upland pine savannas. And that was really cool. Um, and I think if you were to go to a place to explore and botanize in Florida, I would absolutely recommend the Panhandle first, um, just because it's a nice introduction and some of those species are similar. But the state is so huge that you'll see completely different plants in 
the southern tip of Florida that you will on the north coast or you know northern section. So it's it's pretty wild, um, and it's been a fun experience. I've seen lots of snakes, uh, which most most people would probably not be a fan of, but I mean, this is what I do, right? So it's it's super exciting. Um, I've seen an indigo snake, which was in, amazing. Um, I've seen gopher tortoise burrows and um, a diversity of birds and katydids, and it's all very cool. And I, I love it. Yeah, I'll say North Florida is kind of a <clears throat> whole different world than what people typically think of Florida, like your central Florida and your, your southern kind of coastal Florida. It's, it's completely different. Yeah, definitely. And I think what has helped uh, is that culture of, you know, maintaining some public lands that are, that are well managed and um, maybe a little less risk of being completely inundated by water in the next century. <laughs> Just Slowly. slightly less risk. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you talking, I said in a lot of programs, I, when, when, when I talk about like tall grass prairie in Illinois, I, I ask folks, what do you think the flattest state is in North America? when you average out the slope across the entire state and everyone says, of course, Kansas. And I'm like, nope, it's actually Florida. I'm like, what's the second flattest state? And they're like, well, that must be Kansas. Like, nope, it's Illinois. And it, that kind of is like shocks them. But as you're speaking, I'm just like, I'm thinking about this and I'm thinking about the similarities of, of topography, vegetation, habitat. And I'm just like, that's really... I mean, the, the commonality between the two states is just very interesting. I know we have Florida guy down there. I, I guess we have, might have Illinois guy around here somewhere. So um, hashtag Illinois guy. We can start that. Um, but but uh, also on, on your blog, I remember um, seeing you had posted a picture of a sylphium down in Florida. And that's one of my favorite tall grass prairie plants. I just love seeing it every year when it's like just starts booming above everything else and um so would would i be able to do you think if i know sylphiums here in illinois i could go down to florida and be like it's got the rough leaves it's it, would i see that that similarity i think so i think the structure of plants is really uh, again knowing genus um like sylphium is a genus right so what are the commonalities and when people ask me like how do you get to know all the plant species, you know, I mean, most of it is I'm, I'm, I'm making a lot up. Uh, <laughs> oh no, I thought you were going to no, say I'm just, just experience. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm, I mean, it's kind of true, but I'm mostly kidding. But I, I think, right. Like you look at something and you can pretty much tell it's an aster, but mm -hmm. asters are so diverse. So getting to know a genus and what's common among those, that genera is really helpful. So you could look at something and say, this structure looks really similar to a sylphium that I have back home, but it's also like kind of different. So it's probably not the same species, but at least I can, you know, now try to key it out or figure out what it is. Um, and I think you totally could, although I have to say one plant has totally thrown me off when I first started going to, down to Florida. There's this plant that looks a lot like a uh, liatris. So it's kind of got this tall stalk, small purple flowers. Um, and when I looked at it more closely, I was like, that's weird. That doesn't actually look like a liatris, which again, liatris is an, is an aster, totally different from something like a sylphium. And when I looked at it more closely, I realized it's a polygola, which is a milkwort. And I'm trying to think there's, there are a couple native species here um, in the state. And it just was like one of those things, like you said, that you you look at it and you're like, it's kind of the same to something I know, but not quite. But at least you have now a, a, a I call it a search image in your brain of like, okay, now I know what to look for, what characteristics have that, and I can try to figure it out from there. Um, so I would say you'd probably have luck with with some of the species, but yeah, the sylphium down there is it's tall, it's got the you know. I should say the tall flowering stalk with leaves that are lower, more basal. Um, and that's a good characteristic for sure. Well, speaking of keying things out, um, talking about field guides. Now you have an amazing uh, set of YouTube videos. I believe that you, I mean, you have wonderful music, good videography. Um, but in one video, you are keying out, um, was it a blackjack oak? Was that correct? Okay. 
Um, and I think I saw in your pack, in your pack, I might be wrong, was that Forest Trees of Illinois that you were using? Yeah, so that's the University of Illinois publication, uh, Forest Trees of Illinois. That's a great one for tree species out here for sure, yeah. Okay, so uh, just a little shameless plug for U of I Extension for Forest Trees of Illinois, go to uh, Pubs Plus to order that or your local extension office. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so what, what are the field guides? Like uh, at, at, at any given day, uh, you reach into your pack, this is the field guide that you reach in for the most. Yeah, I. this isn't gonna be a, <laughs> super uh, technical, but I actually really love photo guides for, I don't wanna say fo photo, but like um, illustrated guides for mm -hmm. introductory. If you're going to a place you've never seen before, um, something that's easy and flip throughable where you don't have you don't have to know family or genera is, is great. Um, so like, for example, when I go down, when I went down to Florida for the first time, I bought a color guide to basically just the most common Florida plant species up in that region. Because again, Florida, North mm -hmm. Florida and South Florida are so different that your field guide could be like this thick, right? Like the flora of the Chicago region, which is, yes. you know, basically mm -hmm. a doorstop, it's huge. Um, and so something like that is great because you can see that it's a purple flower. You kind of have a general idea of the shape and where it's at in, and with the range that it might have, but otherwise you're like, I have no idea what it is. So at least that can cut down your options quickly. Um, but if you're looking for something a little more in depth, you know, of course you would be, you have to say Mullenbrock, uh, key to vascular plants for Illinois because it's it's a wonderful key for figuring out from a genera the species that you're looking at. So um, that would be the guide that I'd say I use the most in Illinois, but um, I do think there is something to be said for having some sort of pictorial or illustrated guide when you're first starting out that's easy to find things, easy to flip through, um, just so you can get an idea of what you're what you're looking at. Some of those plant descriptions and the more uh, text uh, heavy ones can be overwhelming. It's like another language. So yeah, I, I hate having to look up all those definitions all the time. Like, well, I don't know, maybe is what am I looking at here? So yeah, I love the, the idea of having more photo oriented type guides. It's great. Yeah. I mean, I also ask a lot of questions, which probably annoys everyone I work with, but <laughs> whenever I'm out with a great botanist or a friend and trying to figure something out, you know, I, I always am like, what's that? What's that? What's that? What's that? And then when I get, you know, an, a, an observation or a designation of what this plant is, I try to figure out why uh, it's associated with that family or whatever. Um, like, for example, if you, if you see a milkweed, you probably can tell it's a milkweed, um, even if you don't know what species it is, mm -hmm. because they all have milky sap, they all have similar structured floral, um, you know, flowers. So yeah, that's, that would be my recommendation is don't be afraid to use whatever you're comfortable with and whatever makes sense to you. And, and are you just like a bank of bad dad puns when it comes to limericks to help memorize plants? Cause I was out, I think Ken, you were there too with Chris Benda um, in Southern Illinois. And he was like the worst when it comes to puns and plants. It was, <laughs> I mean, so grown worthy, but it helps memorize stuff. Look, do you know some, any, do, what? Do you know any off the top of your mind? I'm interested to hear some. They were mostly on ferns. Um, oh, really? And he, you'd look at the bottom of the leaf, and he would say, "I don't remember. I can't remember." I actually had I have a video of him. I should I should review that. But um, yeah, he he would look at the ferns and things, and it would he would just be and we'd be like, oh. Yeah, so I don't know, Ken, if you remember any of those. Uh, there, there was Sedges, too. But yeah, I don't remember. Oh, yeah. I didn't know what he was talking about half the time. So. <laughs> <laughs> I I don't, honestly. I I mean, there's like brushes are round, Sedges have edges, you know, like something like mm -hmm. that is kind of a fun, but I'm actually terrible with that. Like I, I remember even in school having those, what is it, like a mnemonic or whatever, like whatever yeah. you call them, like remembering devices I could never remember the remembering device so like even <laughs> even right now the one I'm thinking of is like mad 
buck cap or something, which is common for figuring out like which trees are alternate and opposite. And if you ask me right now, if my life depended on it, I couldn't, mm -hmm. I think it's maple ash dogwood. dogwood. Right. And then mm -hmm. somewhere in there, there's a buckeye. Uh, and then I, that's pretty much all I remember. <laughs> I'm terrible yeah. at it. Yeah. You're safe here, so it's okay. <laughs> I, I couldn't. I couldn't throw any more in there if I tried. So, have you ever had to introduce um, someone to your what you do in the field? Um, and then, like, if you have done something like that, how do you go about it? Is there some place that you like to start them off um, that can be easily relatable, or or what's your process that you do for um, introducing beginners? So you mean introducing like literally taking people out into the field or, or kind of telling them about what I do and my, my job. More so taking them out to the field. Oh yeah. Um, well, a perfect example is, is my boyfriend. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've made him my field assistant a couple of years in a row because it helps with COVID, you know, having part of your pod, who's also a botanist and really interested in, in plants. So, um, going going somewhere that is i always say go to the worst site first and work your way up um so go to the place that's thorny and uh nasty and mean first so that then you're like wow look at all this um but i mean i'm mostly kidding but i would say i think people think that field botany is this just like you know, magical world. And like a lot of days you're going to sites that are just super not pleasant. And I can say any of my colleagues that work in wetlands around Illinois can definitely uh, attest to the, the brutalness of some of these sites. Um, you're often working in, in conditions where it's super hot, super humid, it's raining, it's an impending tornado, uh, there's insects. So I try to introduce whoever I'm I have out to the full range of, of joy when it comes to field work, because, um, it's all part of the, you know, it's all part of the experience. I think that lets people know that it's not all just, you know, frolicking around in, in beautiful fields of <laughs> plants and insects, but it's the part that keeps you coming back. Right. Um, so yeah, I try to, I try to get people out and I like quizzing people is one of my favorite things, you know, going out and saying, you know, someone says, oh, what's that? And I would say, well, what do you think it is? You know, what, what, what can you tell me about it? Where is it growing? What other plants is it growing with? Um, what would, what would you do to try to figure out what this plant is? And that's, that's the best part of learning, I think, is trying to figure it out yourself, right? So. And the most frustrating part. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the random questions we get of pixelated photos, like someone's like, what is this weed? And like, no, I can barely make out a leaf. I don't know. Oh yeah. There's a great meme out there right now. That's like every field biologist ever. And it just says like, it's like a blurry picture of a bird in a tree. <laughs> it's like, can you tell me what this bird is? It's like yeah. that season has started, you know, it's fun though. It's fun. Mm -hmm. So speaking of, of kind of going out and doing field body, are there any good places here in West Central Illinois um, that you're aware of? Are there kind of any areas we should be kind of on the lookout for? Yeah, definitely. There's there's many places. So I, I always say there's a lot of great habitat in Illinois. You just have to work a little bit harder to find it. So it's maybe different than if you're living in the middle of the Appalachian Mountains and you can go 20 minutes in any direction and find a trail. But um, what I love about Illinois is that the habitats are so varied. You know, we have wetland habitats, we have prairie habitats, we have savannas, we have uh, old growth forests, you know, and big forests in many places of the state also. We have fens and seeps and, and um, areas that have been untouched by glaciers, right? Up in the Northwest part of the state where you have this crazy, um, flora compared to the rest of the state. So at least in this area, I would say some of my favorite places to go, um, and I always think about it as a, you know, going out type of radius, really close by, I enjoy some of the Champaign County Forest Preserve District properties. Um, 
Hidden Acres is a favorite, but now I'm afraid that I, you know, might tip everyone off on my favorite quiet spot and <laughs> it won't be so quiet anymore. But they had an incredible bluebell display early this spring. Um, there's great big trees. I always see birds nesting there. Um, last year I saw a gnat catcher, a blue gray gnat catcher up in a tree nesting. Um, also nearby, of course, Kickapoo and Kennecook County Park are both really floristically um, interesting places. They have um, shooting stars, lots of trilliums in the spring, and then all the way through the summer and fall still have really unique plants and great birding. And then as you kind of work your way out, um, Embora or um, the Grand Prairie Friends property, just about an hour and a half south of here in Charleston is really exceptional. They have a unique flora there of kind of some species you would see in Appalachia, but not really anywhere else. So some I can think of are, um, there's a plant called Indian Physic or um, Epicac, which you guys might know as the drink that you're back in, if you're, I'm not old enough to have this, but it's like a, a drink to make you throw up. Um, if you like swallowed poison or something. Um, so that's a, you know, plant that I don't commonly see, um, but you can find it at that preserve. Poke milkweed, um, some other cool plants. And again, great birding. Um, Sand Ridge and Henry Allen Gleason out on the Western part of the state are really cool spots. Again, about two hours. So it's a little bit of a haul, um, but I enjoy going there. Heron County Park, anywhere along the Illinois River is great birding. Um, and then if you're getting a little wild, you can go all the way up more kind of to the Northwestern part of the state. And we took a trip last summer, um, you know, peak pandemic trying to be like, where can we go that we won't see anybody? <laughs> and we went up to the Driftless area near Apple River Canyon and um, I'm trying to remember Palisades State Park area, right near the border of Iowa. And yeah, just really cool. Uh, plant life, you get a little bit more topography, um, water, which is, I'm always craving being in central Illinois. So I, yeah, there's endless amounts of places to enjoy. And it, it makes me sad because a lot of times I talk to friends or people who've been here for much longer than I have, and they've seen far fewer places. And um, I mean, one of my greatest joys living here has just been finding the cool spots to, to explore. So yeah, definitely get out there and check it out. And I, so I think one of the resources people might be able to use, so you have a, a website, um, which is, it's an amazing window into what we've been talking about and what you do, but you go into so much more. I mean, like horticulture speaking, you talk about vegetables, ornamental plants, house plants. Um, and as, uh, it, as I was surfing around there, um, you know, preparing for the show, stalking as the best of us do, um, I, I saw that you have created a uh, online magazine. So it looks seasonal and um, the design and the layout and some of the stories remind me a lot of the Illinois Steward, which I don't know if listeners may or may not know, but it's a, it's a older publication, but um, you know, kind of in that vein of like Aldo Leopold, you know, it's, it's about nature kind of, you know, journaling, cataloging that, that uh, stuff. So um, tell me, Sarah, about this magazine. Um, can people, we'll link to it, of course, but uh, can people just go look at it? Uh, and, and why? Why did you start this? Yeah, I started uh, Midwest Explorer. It's called as a pandemic need. I hmm. needed to do something different because um, as a field botanist, not being able to go into the field, it's just like a huge void of time and space where you're like, I don't know really what I mean, I have plenty of work to do, don't get me wrong, but some sort of creative outlet, something to do that's um, picking a different part of my brain. And I found it really helpful to start working on this when I started working on writing my thesis because, you know, technical writing can be tough. And so I, I used it as kind of an exercise to write creatively and it would kickstart my brain a little bit every morning to get me in the process of writing. Um, and the other reason is really I was spending, I was able and fortunate to have so much more time in my garden than I usually have because for field work, I'm usually traveling from 
on and off from April to September. Um, so I have a lot less time here in Illinois in my garden. So now I had endless mm. and an openness of time to, to spend. And it was probably one of the best summers of my life just because, um, yeah, that, that stretching of time that we rarely are able to enjoy as a, as a human species in modern society. So yeah, it came up as just like needing a creative outlet. And I have a lot of friends and colleagues that are also very into plants and the outdoors. And I kind of modeled it after this. I've always wanted to do kind of like a, a, a zine, but I'm not punk enough, I guess, to do it the OG way. You know, I just, I do it in a very graphically uh, technical way, but I liked the idea of having it being a collaborative, collective work that's not just my work. So I asked a lot of friends to contribute pieces about really whatever whatever they're interested in. So if it's they wanna, they're working with something new, like my friend Deb, uh, who works for the extension, wrote something about masa corn, like making cornmeal from corn she grew at her home. And um, my friend Sarah, who, um, has a community garden plot on her, on her property to write something about her experience doing that. Um, and really just trying to find people in the area that are doing good for food insecurity, um, who are offering events for education, like the Illinois extension webinars and, um, community programs. And it ranges really from just whatever I'm interested in at the moment. And I, I had kind of told myself I wouldn't monetize my hobbies in 2020. And so the, the, the zine is free and you can just download it and, and read it. And um, anyone's welcome to contribute to it and, or contribute photos or whatever, really. So it's, yeah, it's everything from here's how to make violet syrup from the violets in your yard to, um, here's this awesome, unique, rare plant species, or here's a stonefly that you've probably never heard of before. So just a, a wide range of things to make people think a little differently. Yeah. But speaking of your garden uh, and more time that you have in it this year, uh, what are some unique vegetables that you're growing? Yeah, I knew this question was coming, so I'm not as prepared as I thought. Um, <laughs> so one cool one that I've struggled with uh, actually is Roselle. So Roselle is a member of the hibiscus family or the mallow family, and it's tropical. So, you know, we get pretty hot humid summers here. So I thought I'd give it a try. I started maybe 20 seeds and I got one plant to survive, which huge success. Um, but it's alive still. And what you can do with Roselle is use the flower buds. So normally on a plant, you know, there's various parts of a plant. You can use leaf, stem, flower, fruit, whatever. So you're actually using the bud before it goes fully to fruit. And the bud produces this kind of red color. Um, and also it's just sweet and edible. So a lot of times like Roselle tea, or um, you can make dye from it. You can do a lot of different things. That's one I'm really excited about. It's it's about, you know, two or three inches right now. So I would highly doubt I'll get anything from it this year, but it's all just fun. Um, I also grew ahi peppers, which are a very small variety of peppers that it's um, admittedly looking terrible right now because it got, it got so hot so fast. Mm -hmm. So I think a misconception about a lot of peppers is that they really enjoy hot, sunny weather. And many of them actually enjoy shady, cooler nights. At least some won't actually even produce fruit if it gets too hot because some are higher elevation species where they have been, um, you know, bred from in the wild. And that was a new uh, new thing for me to learn. Um, so growing this species has been kind of a, an interesting journey. Um, let's see, what are some other strange things in our house? Um, we did grow quite a large variety of solanums last year. So tomatoes that are actually not edible, but, um, species types. So one I can think of is solanum atropurium. It's incredibly spiky. It has these 
long, um, deadly <laughs> hairs on the stem and the leaves. And it produces these beautiful, small, light purple flowers with small orange fruits. And again, you can't eat them, um, but it's cool because it's a species type. You know, most of the vegetables we grow are these cultivars or varieties that have been bred for specific reasons. And this is just, you know, a, a tomato that's growing in the wild somewhere. Um, so growing things like that, I think are, are the most fun. I like seeing what plants look like in the wild. Um, and what, you know, why, I, I think one thing we miss a lot as gardeners is we try to fit all things into the, like we're trying to grow British species <laughs> in mm -hmm. the middle of America and it just doesn't work. We don't have the same conditions. Um, so I really tried hard over the last couple of years to stop fitting a square peg into a round hole and trying to instead find unique varieties and plants that will do better in our climate. Cause why am I trying to grow spinach? Right. We were just, you said that in the beginning, like my spinach yes. will be happy with the cool temperatures. <laughs> well, now I'm trying to grow, you know, New Zealand spinach, which is a kinopode, mm -hmm. um, or, you know, a heat tolerant lettuce or something like that, that, that will be much more successful instead of shaming myself for not getting it to grow. So. Yeah. My spinach is already bolted in it. I mean, it's only been a few weeks. <laughs> We would be able to harvest yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, I always joke. I'm like, well, there goes radish season. Like, mm -hmm. I, you know, people have luck with radishes, and I just, I put them in the ground, and it's like they immediately bolt before I even get a root. So, yeah, yeah. it is what it is. Well, Ken, I hope you were taking notes there of uh, new plants to try. Ken is our, a, we, we follow last year was cotton and Ooh. peanuts. Yes. This what year was the other one? Peanuts. <clears throat> This year we've got some rice and marshmallow. I would love to grow rice. Uh, probably not this year. Probably not going to work out for me this year, but I would love to hear about your experience with rice because I'm very oh. interested. I can, I can say at least for our cat, likes eating the seedlings. <laughs> so I, <laughs> I had to restart it several times. The stuff I put out was had been eaten down a couple of times. So we'll see how well it works out. If you grew... Yeah her tomato varieties or her solemn varieties <laughs> that may take care of your cat problem yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> or just create like a big fence around your your rice <laughs> with all the spiky stuff you know you gotta have more cacti in right. the garden the problem is it was inside trying to start the seed she kept climbing on the seed starting rack and <laughs> uh -oh. eating it so now that it's outside it's it's safe hopefully good yes. well until the squirrels find it and then <laughs> Yeah, I got to figure the squirrel problem out now. <laughs> the dog doesn't help with the squirrels either, I know, because she's she's more just likes to buddy up with them. Yeah, probably. Yeah, my my boyfriend grew peanuts last year, and they we've grown them two years in a row, and they did great the first year, but we just don't have the space. You get like one peanut plant, and then you, mm -hmm. you're like, wow, look at my handful of peanuts that I grew all summer. <laughs> yeah, we, um, we grew them, and then I, I burnt them when I roasted no! them. So. <laughs> oh, that's a tragedy. But yeah, the squirrels got into them like the day before we were going to harvest them. And my boyfriend's like, I swear I'm going to kill them all. I'm like, <laughs> you didn't cover them. Like, you got to fence them. We have to go nuclear with, with squirrels here. You got to mm -hmm. cover everything. So. Oh, yeah. Our boreal tree rats. I love them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love them though. <laughs> well, that was a lot of great information. So Sarah Johnson with a uh, research assistant with the Illinois Natural History Survey. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Yeah. Thanks a lot. It was nice to, um, you know, talk about my research, but also just, I love, clearly I love plants and it's, it's always nice to, to share that with the world. So I hope people get out and take some of my recommendations and go out for a hike. Yes, I, I, no better time like the present. I think National Trails Day is coming up first weekend of June. Get out to your favorite natural area or go to Sarah's website and find a natural area that she's wrote about. And uh, yeah, go, go take a hike, people. Get out there. So the, the Good Growing Podcast is produced by Wendy Ferguson and edited by me, Chris Enroth. A special thanks to our co-hosts with us every single week. Ken and Katie, thank you so much for being here as well. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, and congratulations on passing your defense in Chris and Ken. It's always a pleasure. 
Yes. Thank you, Sarah. And if anybody's wondering, we're not related. <laughs> Jack, or married. Johnson's, yes. <laughs> Johnson's are a dime a dozen. <laughs> and Chris, is, Chris and Katie, thank you. Let's do this again next week. Oh, we shall do this again next week. Uh, we'll take a little bit of a hiatus because Ken, that, he had to go on vacation. You know, he's got that family going on vacation, seeing the world. So, all right, Ken, we'll let that happen. But um, uh, we will have uh, we will have some shows coming up uh, next show. I know we have slated. We're going to be talking with Aaron Garrett. We're going to be discussing renewable energy, how that's going in here in Illinois. So listeners, thank you for doing what you do best, and that is listening, or if you're watching us on YouTube, watching, and as always, keep on growing.